Hey there nation and welcome to the show where we help you to play miniatures wargaming on a budget. It is I, Commander Cheapskate, and we are back with another episode of Commander Cheapskate Gamer Reviews. And this is the series where we review various products related to the wargaming hobby. And today we are continuing on with our review of the 9th edition Warhammer Fantasy Rules written by the Warhammer's Army Project. And the author, of course, is Matthias Eliasson. So we've been going through each one of the Army books that he and his collection one by one. And on today's episode, we'll be taking a look at the 9th edition rules for Warhammered Lizardmen. So in case you're not aware, the Warhammer Armies Project is a absolute free website. It's a blogger site that hosts various PDFs for 8th edition as well as 9th edition Warhammer Fantasy rules. Um, during the 8th edition Warhammer Fantasy, Matthias Eliasson created different PDF rulebooks for different factions that never received an army rulebook of their own. Things like updating the Bretonians army book up to 8th edition, same thing with Beastmen. He also made books for factions that don't exist yet, so groups like the uh, Forces of Albion, for example, the Army of Grand Cathay, the Pirates of Sartosa. These are different factions that he actually created rules for, and they're actually quite good and very professional looking. In fact, if you look at this PDF here, if you didn't know any better, you would assume this was an actual official Games Workshop document. So in this review, we'll be going over, of course, the different units as well as our unit rules. We'll be looking at special characters as well as magic and magic items. And then finally, we'll give out a review of the army list and our overall impression of the document as well. And because this video is going to be a little bit longer, I will put timestamps down in the description box below so that way you guys can click to the various sections that most apply to you. So that being said, let's get this video review on a roll. All right, so the very first thing we do, of course, is look at the army rules. So if we go down to the table of contents, as you can see, it's beautifully done with artwork. He did, and Matthias Eliasson did an extremely beautiful job with his desktop publishing on this document as well. Like I said, it looks almost official. That's how good it really is. Now, if we look here at the contents, of course, we have our different lore as well as the story and narrative of the Lizardmen. We're going to skip that portion because that's not so much of a focus on this one. We're just more focused on the rules. So because that, we're going to go directly to the forces of Lustria, and we're going to talk about the different units as well as our army rules. So let's go ahead and get that started. So starting off with the special army rules, we have cold-blooded. Whenever a model with this special rule takes a leadership test, it rolls an additional dice and dis uh, discards the highest result. So because that cold-blooded is still a rule that the entire army pretty much receives for the most part. And of course we have our predatory fire rule. It says whenever a model with this special rolls a six to hit in close combat, it immediately makes another attack, roll to hit and wound as normal. Attacks generated by a predatory fighter special rule do not generate further attacks. This applies to all fighting models in the unit, including models making supporting attacks. In addition, a unit that contains one or more models with this special rule can never test to restrain pursuit. So once again, that predatory fighter war rule is still a big part of how lizardmen do things, which kind of makes sense because you know, they got huge mouths and they bite you so that's how it works so let's go talk about our slam mage priest real quick so for the most part they have relatively remained the same since the previous edition as well so you know very mediocre stats but then again you're not taking them for their stats you're taking them for their magical ability it says a uh, slam mage priest is a level four wizard uses spells lore of magic high magic or one of the eight lores of battle magic in the warhammer rulebook so if i remember correctly with the army list i think they're automatically level four right off the bat. They of course still have their cold-blooded sp skills, uh, special rule. They also still have their Mage Priest Palanquin uh, special rule as well. And they also have their Telepathic Confabulation special rule as well. So because it says at the start of each friendly magic phase before dice are rolled to determine the strength of the winds of magic, you may pick two friendly wizards with this special rule anywhere in the battlefield and they may exchange a single spell with each other. In subsequent turns, a different pairing of wizards with this special rule may be chosen. So once again, very powerful magical ability. And the reason why is because that way you can take some range spells. Let's say, for example, you're not within range. You can use this telepathic confabulation spell uh, ability to give that spell to a unit that's in range. That way they can cast it for you. So very powerful ability there. So now we're moving on to our Saurus leaders. As always, we have our Saurus Old Bloods as well as Scar Veterans as well. Still got some pretty good stats. Cold-Blooded Predatory Fighter. Natural Armor Save of a 4 for Old Bloods. 5 up 4 for Scar Veteran as well. Um, they kind of nerfed them a little bit with their armor saves. If I remember correctly, I believe Old Blood's got a three up is what they end up having. So, and then I think they had a four up for Scar Veterans, but uh, you know, balance, I guess, and all that stuff. 
So continuing on, we also have our Soros Warriors. So their stats relatively remain the same as well. Not much change there. I think they had a 5-up originally from their natural armor. I'm not really sure on that one. But as you can see, they have a 6-up armor save. Still have their Cold Rudder as well as Predatory Fighter abilities. And then we, of course, have our Cold One Riders. So that one, of course, still remains the same. They cause fear this time, so that's pretty cool as well. 5-up natural armor. And, of course, they still got to worry about stupidity because they are riding Cold Ones. So we do have that rule attached to those guys. And then we have, of course, our Saurus Temple Guard. They have relatively made the same as well. They still have their Guardian as well as Sacred Duty Special Rules. Stats are relatively stay the same as well. They have a 5-up natural armor save for these guys. So uh, that part's pretty cool as well. So like I said before, not much change for them. Skinks have remained relatively the same as well. It is kind of interesting though. They did give separate stats for um, Skirmishers as well as Skinks, even though they're exactly the same, which is pretty weird. The difference though is that the Skink Brave in a normal unit of Skinks has two attacks, while the Patrol Leader only has one attack. So if that was a huge problem for you, um, there's that as well. They still can still have their aquatic special rule as well as cold blood and skirmishers. And of course they do have their ability to mix it up with Crocs Gore as usual. So those rules have still remained the same. So if you want to give your units of uh, skinks some more hitting power, Crocs Gore are the way to go for that. Then of course we have our skink priests. They make a return as well. Uh, weapon skill two, weapon blessed skill strength of three, two toughness, two wounds, four initiative, one attack, five leadership. They can take spells from the lore of Fire, Light, Heavens, Life, and Beasts. I believe they were able to use all eight lores, if I remember correctly. I think. But that is no longer the case, though, so they can actually kind of limit them a little bit as well. They also have their Aquatic as well as their Cold Blood rules. We have our Arcane Vessel uh, ability. It says a Slam Mage Priest can choose to cast any Magic Missile or Direct Spell through a model with this special within 24 inches of him. If he does so, measure the spell's range from the Arcane Vassal and use the model's forward arc and line of sight for the purposes of casting the spell. If using an Arcane Vassal, a Slam Mage Priest can cast Magic Missiles even if his own unit is engaged in close combat. If a spell cast through an arcane vassal is miscast, the result of the miscast is applied to the slam mage priest, but the arcane vassal suffers a strength 3 hit due to the magical feedback. So we do have a little bit of a change on those rules as well. Then we have a brand new uh, skink chiefs, of course. So these are our hero level um, skinks. So of course they have uh, pretty good stats for those guys as well. They still have their aquatic and cold blooded ability. And then of course we have our chameleon skinks. They make a return as well. Similar stats as before, I believe they bumped up the Blister skill a little bit for these guys. Still got their Cold-Blooded Scouts and Skirmisher Special Rule. Also have their Chameleon Special Rule as minus one to hit with weapons, so that's still a plus for those guys. Now I do believe this is a brand new one. We do have Skink Horned One Riders. I think this is a throwback from the 4th and 5th edition of Warhammer Fantasy Battle. Originally, Saurus did not ride Cold Ones originally, and when they first came out, it was originally just Skinks that were the only ones to get able to do that. So they brought these ones back. Um, so as you can see, we have our Great uh, great Crescent Snake, a Skinks, three weapon skill, three strength, two toughness, one wound, four initiative, one attack, and six leadership. And of course, we have our Horned Ones. Uh, they have four strength, four toughness, movement eight, three initiative, two attacks, three leadership as well. So these guys are really cool as well. They're actually fast cavalry now. They're not just normal cavalry anymore. They still have their cold blooded, they still have their natural armor of five up, they still cause fear, and they have bestial roar. If a character mounted on a horned one joins a unit of cold ones, all cold ones gained the hatred special rule as long as the horned one remains in the unit. So now they have hatred as well. And then we have Mount of Etzel. A character must have the blessed spawning of Etzel, see secret spawnings in order to ride a horned one. So that is a new character mount now for characters as well. And of course we have a whole unit of these guys that skinks can ride. So that is actually pretty cool as well, bringing those old units back. And of course, we have Jungle Swarms. They have not changed all that much, so they're back once again. And we have our Croxagore. Those guys are back as well. They have Aquatic, Cold-Blooded, Predatory Fire, Natural Armor 5 up. Still pretty solid stats with those guys as well, so those guys would be all kinds of cool. And of course, we have our Pterodon Riders. They also make a return to this edition as well. Uh, they still have their drop rocks, four strider, cold blooded, fear fly rule, poison attacks for javelins only. Their fire leech bolas actually now are now strength four. If I remember correctly, I believe they were strength five, uh, three in the previous edition, so now they're up to strength four, but they have only a six inch range, so we do have that for our fire leech bolas. And then, of course, we have our ripperdactyl riders, our shock frenzy units, they're flying, so as you can see, they have art piercing one, uh, frenzy, as well as killing blow. They also have fear and fly as well. So their stats remain the same. We still have their Toad Rage. So that ability still counts with them as well. So these are the premier fast cavalry flowering frenzy type of monsters that we remember them 
from previous editions as well, which is actually kind of cool. So, of course, we have our salamander hunting packs. Those flaming, <laughs> fire-breathing salamanders, they're back as well. So because of that we have them, and of course, their misfire still counts as eating their skin candlers. So we still have those rules for those guys. Same thing with our razor down hunting packs. Those guys are still around as well. They cause an artillery dice with their shots. Strength four, quick to fire. And of course, they got their stats, so it makes them pretty deadly in close combat still. So that's kind of nice to see those changes. Uh, lack of changes, rather. We have our Bastilodons, so our Bastilodons are back. And actually, these guys are actually a bit better now. Before, in the previous edition, they could not have Stubborn. They didn't have Stubborn in their special rules previously. They now have Stubborn now, so we still have that. Impervious Defenses, Thunderous Bludgeoning. We also have our Arc of Sotek that we still use for our Swarms. We have our Retrification Crystal as well, which gives all cold-blooded units within 8 inches one or more Blue Stilodons with a Rarefied Kiss, which gains a Regeneration of 6-up save. And of course, we still have our Beam of Chocheck. Uh, that's still there as well. Magic Missile. Causes D3 Strength 3 hits, D6 Strength 4 hits, 2D6 Strength 5 hits, 2D6 Strength 6 hits. In addition, the target suffers minus 1 penalty to their weapon skill and ballistic skill to the start of the Bastilodon's next magic phase. So, that's very powerful as well. So, that Beam of Chotek is back again, and that thing is absolutely devastating. So, that's all kinds of cool. And then, of course, we have the return of the Stegodons as well. So, as you can see here, we have our Stegodons as well as Ancient Stegodons. Uh, their stats have relatively made the same. Uh, we do have our impact hits, natural armor 3 up, 4 up, stubborn as well. They can take giant bows. They can also still take giant blowpipes, engine of the gods as well. We have our unstoppable stampede, which gives you your devastating charge rule. And of course, we still have our sharpened horns, which cause the D3 multiple wounds. So that is really cool as well. Now, the difference though, I believe Stegodons were originally special choices, I think is what they actually were. They actually made into rare choices now, which of course kind of nerfs them a little bit because now with these new 9th edition rules, um, you can only take double rare choices if you have um, at least 3,000 points in your army, which I don't like because I don't like when people limit my choices that way, but that's just me personally, and we've talked to that topic to death over time, so don't need to get into that too much. And of course, we have our Carnosaurs. They're back as well. The premier riding mounts for your guys' um, for your guys' uh, scar uh, for your old bloods. Yeah, they kind of nerfed these guys a little bit too. Not in the terms of their stats, but in who can take them now. So now only lower level choices can take a Carnosaur now. So uh, your scar veteran, who is your hero choice, they can no longer ride these guys anymore. So that part's kind of sad. And of course, we still have our special runes of D3, multiple wounds, natural armor four up. Blood Frenzy, Blood Roar, and the Looping Stride. Those are still here in this edition as well. So, then of course we have our Troglodons. Now, Troglodons are actually kind of interesting now because originally Troglodons could be taken as a rare choice. That is no longer the case. As you can see here, um, bam, there's no more Oracle anymore. So the Oracle is no longer a choice now for the Troglodon. So you really can't take them anymore just by themselves. They actually act as character mounts now. So they did kind of nerf these guys a little bit, but at the same time, not... I don't know how to really explain it. It's kind of weird. Like, you could originally just take it as a rare choice originally. That's no longer an option. Now it's a character mount only. So if you did like the Troglodon because you liked the Oracle and what the Oracle could do, that's no longer an option anymore. So that part is kind of sad. But at the same time though, it also kind of makes sense that they made it into a character mount because now you might want to take one just for that character mount, but I digress. There's a lot of things that can go back and forth with this uh, on the viewpoints on that one. So like we said before, still pretty big Oracle stats for Monster, still has poison attacks, Predatory Fighter, as well as Natural Armor 4 up. That Primeval Roar was the reason you actually took one of these things to begin with, so that part's kind of nice. And of course they still spit Venom, but like I said before, they can only now be taken as a character choice. That's the only thing that can take him now. Now we have a brand new unit. Now let's get to our brand new units. We have the Dread Saurian. This was the monster that was from the Forge World line of miniatures. So now it's actually part of the army book now. Movement 7, weapon skill 4, 7 strength, 6 toughness, 6 wounds, 1 initiative, 6 attacks, and 6 leaderships. Cold blooded immunity to psychology causes multiple wounds for its attacks. Natural armor 3 up. Now the main reason why you want this bag boy is because of the upgrades on this one. So this thing is worth a lot of points uh, if you kit him out differently. So we have the uh, T-Pox um, Crystalline Eye. Our Dreaded Saurian, bearing the crystal known as the Eye of T-Pox, gains a 4 ward save against non-magical attacks. Pretty powerful there. We also have the Blazing Configuration of Chotek. The Dreaded Saurian gains a Flaming Attack Special Rule that causes 2d6 Strength 3 Flaming Impact hits. 
So bring the fire. We also have the Golden Shroud of uh, Zlat Total. Uh, all attacks targeting the Dread Sword suffering minus one to hit modifier. In addition, all models which are considered demonic or undead in base contact with the Dread Sword gain the Always Strikes last special rule. So that's actually kind of cool there as well. We have Quetzal's Flawed Hearthstone. The Dread Sword gains the Unbreakable special rule and reduces movement rate to five, but increases toughness to seven. So it makes it super tough there. And of course, we have the Shadow Rubius of uh, Huanchi. The Dread Soaring gains the Ambusher Deployment Special Rule, a plus one movement. Models firing at it as part of a stand and shoot delivery uh, charge reaction must reroll successful hits. So this one is a really crazy upgrade. If you want to put a monster right in the back ranks right off the start, this thing could really tear up some things. So like if you're facing gun lines, for example, Dwarven gun lines, I would highly recommend using this to kind of counter that. Or Wood Elves, for example, or armies that just really play defensively, this could really screw up your enemy's program if you use those. So we'll talk a little about this a little bit more when we get to the actual army list. And then we have a new monster called a Coatl. So these are like the flying serpent mystery creatures from uh, Latin American myth. So let's go and talk about those guys real quick. Brand new unit as well. Movement 5, weapon skill 4, 5 strength and toughness and wounds, 2 initiative, 4 attacks, and 8 leadership. It's a monster, it's got cold blooded fly, magical resistance 3, and natural armor 4 up. We have this rule magical storm, all missile fire directed at a quaddle suffers a minus 1 to hit, and we have the guardian of the sacred places. A quaddle has the following innate bound spell, power level 3. If cast, a Lizardman player may reposition D3 pieces of forest terrain by D6 inches, rolling the distance for each piece at a time. So, kind of like a mediocre bounce spell, but then again, it could also be kind of good as well if you want to add things to like disrupt your opponents, for example, in close combat, or if you want to make cavalry choices take dangerous terrain tests, or just move forests out of the way for Wood Elf players. This could really mess up their plans as well, so... That part is really, really cool there for that. So, And also, I forgot to mention, this can also be taken as a character mount, too. But like I said, we'll talk about that a little bit more when we can actually get to the army lists. All right, so now that we're done with the army units as well as the army rules, the next thing we're going to talk about real quick are the special characters. All right, so now we're back with the special characters. So as you can see, Lord Mazamundi, he actually makes a return again. Uh, I believe his stats have re relatively stayed the same for the most part. So we're actually not going to spend too much time on that character as well. But like I said before, he's still the, the still the kitted out combat character who rides a Stegadon, who's also a, uh, you know, what you call it, a, uh, a slam mage priest that can still fight. So he is still very much a uh, part of it as well. We have Lord Crook as well. He's back. Um, I believe he's relatively remained the same as well. Um, I'm not sure if this was the case or not, but he only knows the, he's a level 4 wizard, but only knows the one spell, Deliverance of Itza, which costs a 10 up, a basic direct damage spell that damages all enemy units within 12 inches. Each target suffers 2d6 strength 4 hits. If the target was a demonic, undead, or vampire, special rule, it suffers 3d6 hits instead. Lord Crow can choose to extend the range of his spell up to 18 inches. If he does so, the casting value is 18 plus. Alternative, Lord Crook can choose to extend the spell to 24 inches, in which case the casting value is now up to 24. So I believe that part is still remaining the same for the most part. And same thing with his magic items too. Moving on, we have Krokgar, the ancient Scar leader, last defender of Z uh, Zoltl is his name. And of course, this is the guy's special character. He was the uh, S uh, Scar veteran or the old guard or the, the Sora's special character, but Karasaur. So he's still very much the same. He actually now becomes the army general if he takes over. He's got a ward suit of five up. He's got his attuned beast to control the berserk rage for our, uh, from his uh, Grimlock, his uh, his Carnosaur, which is a Transformers throwback. So that is also kind of cool as well. He still has his spiel of uh, Talantula as well as his Hand of the Gods ability. So he still has those two. Then of course we have Chak Axe, the Attorney Warden, Prime Guardian of Zlan Huape, Huapek. Um, he's still here as well. Still very powerful items as well. He's relatively remained the same uh, from my understanding as well. Same thing with Gorok, the albino um, uh, sort of special character. Uh, he's remained pretty much the same as well. So because of that, I'm not going to spend too much time on those guys as well. Now, of course, we have uh, Nakai the Wanderer. I believe this guy is a throwback from the older editions of Warhammer Fantasy. So he's a throwback character. So he's back with movement 6, weapon skill 5. Uh, strength is 6, toughness 5, 4 wounds, 3 initiative, 5 attacks, leadership 8 as well. Monsters and free special character. He's got a 3 up armor save, 4 up regen save. He's also got blessed mark of the old ones. Uh, basically, Nakai has the hold your ground ability, and any that kills Nakai in close combat may not overrun 
as the path is will be blocked by mines and creepers. If Nakai flees from combat, then the victorious you may not pursue. So that part's kind of cool as well. He's got a jungle spirit ability. He can't join a unit, and he has the ambusher special rule, with, uh, except that he will always appear from a wood, swamp, or water terrain feature rather than the table edge if able to. And then we, of course, have the Sacred Blade of Quetzal. And that's a great weapon, gives him a 5 award save. So I believe this character's from the f older editions of Warhammer Fantasy Battle. Now, of course, we have Ten Hen Huan, who is the Prophet of Sotek. He's back, of course, uh, the most powerful uh, skink character that they have. And I believe he's relatively remained the same as well. Not much change has really happened to him for his stats or his special abilities, so epic there. And then we have Teto Iko, Astro Astro Astromancer of the Constellation, the Beholder. He's relatively stayed the same as well. So not much really change has happened with that character as well. And of course, you know, he's the same skink that's basically like a slam because his mind is in the higher dimensions of consciousness. And of course, we have Tic-Tac-Toe. He's back again. This is the guy who rode the Pterodon special character. So he's back. Um, his rules have relatively remained the same as well. So we're not going to spend too much on him. So that part's pretty neat. And of course we have Zaltal, uh, Ozaltal, I believe is how you pronounce his name. This character is the, um, the Chameleon Skink special character. He's also back as well. And of course he's got his different uh, stats associated with him. So we're not gonna really spend too much time on him as well. And then we have Enzi Huinzi, uh, he's back as well. This is the actual, um, what you call it? Another throwback character as well. He was actually from the 4th edition of Warhammer Fantasy. Like I said before, originally Skinks were the only ones who could actually ride Cold Ones originally. Um, and the first time they actually came out. So he's a throwback from the 4th edition. He's, he's here weapon skill 4, 5 blizzard skill, 4 strength, 3 toughness, 2 wounds, 6 initiative, 3 attacks, 7 leadership as well. He's riding uh, his uh, Zlutch Peltli, his uh, special uh, little uh, Cold One that he actually could ride on as well. He's got the Bestial Roar. Cold-Blooded Fear, Natural Armor 6 up. He's got his Hail of Darts. Gives him three multiple shots with poison attacks, quick to fire. So that's actually pretty cool there too. And with that special character done, that takes us directly to the magic as well as the magical items. All right, so now we're back with the lore of high magic. So for the spells themselves, they're actually exactly the same as the same spells that the High Elves use, so we're not going to really go too much into it for the spells. However, for the Lower Attribute, though, it does change a little bit. It says if it is Contemplations, if a spell from the Lore of High Magic is successfully cast by a wizard from the Lizardman Army, the caster can immediately choose a new spell the same level or lower from one of the eight lores of magic in the Warhammer rulebook, which will last for the remainder of the magic phase. If the wizard chooses a spell from a different lore, that newly chosen spell will always use that spell's lore attribute. So very, very powerful ability now for your magic users now for the slam, which is really cool. So now that we have magic casting abilities and casting levels, you can actually use a whole bunch of barraging of different effects if you want to, which should actually be really cool to actually see that on the battlefield. Now, continuing on, of course, we have our new Sacred Spawnings rules. So because of this, these are some of the details that we can get for some of our characters. We have the Blessed Mark of the Old Ones for 10 points. You can only have one of these in your army. Characters, not including special characters. The character may reroll a total of three dice, to either to hit, to wound, armor saves, or war saves during the game. So not bad for 10 points. It's actually a pretty powerful ability. We have the Blessed Spawning of Sotek for 10 points. Model with this blessing, have the Devastating Charge special rule. We have this Blessed Spawning of Etzel for 5 points, Mounted Models only, Models of this Blessed will spawn, Reroll Fails to Pity or Berserker charge, uh, charge Tests. We also have our Blessed Spawning of Quetzal for 5 points, Model with this Special Spawning gain the Natural 6 Armor Save Special Rule. We also have the Blessed Spawning of Zlat Kultul for 5 points, Models of this blessing, Blessed Spawning have the Immunity to Psychology Special Rule. We have the Blessed Spawning of Chotak for 10 points. Models of this Blessed Spawning rerolled failed charge and pursuit rolls. The Blessed Spawning of Huanchi for 5 points. Models on foot only. Models of this blessing, Blessed Spawning have the Ambushers and Forest Strider special rule. We have the Blessed Spawning of Tip Hawk for 10 points. Models of this uh, Blessed Spawning have the Magic Resistance 1 special rule. And then the Blessed Spawning of Zun uh, Zunki for 5 points. Models of foot only. Models of this Blessed Spawning have the Aquatic Special Rule and a 2 plus initiative. So there we have for you guys' Blessed Spawnings. So now we also have Disciplines of the Old Ones. These are for your Slan Mage Priests. So we have Higher States of Consciousness for 40 points. Slan Mage Priest has the Ethereal Special Rule but cannot join units. We have Focus and Mystery for 30. The Slan Mage Priest has the Lore Master Special Rule. This discipline cannot be combined with the Wandering Deliberation uh, Discipline. 
We have Wandering Deliberations for 30 points. Instead of knowing spells normally, the Slam Mage Priest knows a signature spell for each of the eight lores of battle magic from the Warhammer rulebook. This discipline cannot be combined with a focus of mystery discipline. So, very powerful ability right there. So that way you can make your guys like two uh, high elf lore masters, which actually have some pretty good access to signature spells. We have Harmonic Convergence. This one's always been popular for 30 points. The Slam Mage Priest rolls two additional dice whenever he attempts to channel or dispel dice. We also have Transcendent Healing for 30 points. This model is alive at the end of any friendly magic phase. Roll a number of d6 equal to the difference between the Slam Mage Priest's starting number of wounds and its current number of wounds. For each roll of a 6, the Slam Mage Priest immediately recovers a single wound loss early in the battle. Focus Rumination for 25 points. Once per magic phase, the Slam may attempt an additional free power dice to the casting attempt. This can cause ultimate power as normal and can cause the Mage Priest to roll more dice than normally allowed. We have the uh, Soul of Stone for 25. When rolling on the miscast table, the Slam Mage Priest can choose to subtract 1 from the result to a minimum of 2 or add 1 to the result to a minimum of 12, maximum of 12 instead of accepting the original result. We have Becalming Cogitation for 25 points. The Slam Mage Priest rerolls its first failed dispel attempt in each magic phase. Reservoir of Eldritch Energy for 20 points. At the end of the opponent's magic phase, the Slam Mage Priest can store a single unused dispel dice remaining in your pool. At the beginning of your next magic phase, roll a d6. On a 2+, plus, you could add that dice to your own power pool. This cannot take your power pool beyond the normal limit. On a roll of one, that bonus dice is lost. If the slan is slain before his next magic phase, then bonus dice is lost. We have Harrowing Scrutiny for 20 points. Slam Mage Priest has the Terror special rule, an unfathomable presence for 20 points. Roll a d3 at the start of each enemy magic phase. The Slam Mage Priest has the Magic Resistance X results uh, special rule until the end of that phase, where the number of one gives Magic Resistance one, a result of two gives Magic Resistance two, and a result of three gives a Magic Resistance three. Now we've also got our Treasures of the Old Ones. We have the Blade of Realities for 85 points. Still remain the same. Same thing with the Piranha Blade for 40. That's remained the same as well. Same thing with the Sacred Stegadon Helm of Itza for 40 points. Cube of Darkness for 30. Those remain the same as well. Plaque of Dom and Dominion. That's 15 points. Cloak of Feathers is 35. And the Horn of Kaigor is also 30 as well. We have our Egg of Quango for 30, so that's still back, that's still in there, that really ma random magic item. We have the Skaven Pelt Banner for 30. I believe this one is actually new, I believe. And it says all models of this unit of the Skaven Pelt Banner gain the Frenzy and Hatred Skaven special rules. However, all models from the Warhammer Skaven gain the Hatred special rule against the unit carrying the banner. And of course we have the Jaguar Standard which gives you a uh, Swift Stride special rule. So now that we're done with the magic items, the last thing we're going to talk about real quick are the Lizardmen army lists. Alright, so now we're back with the army lists on this one. So let's go and talk about the army's uh, list for the Lizardmen. So for the Lords, of course, we got 700 points now for Lord Mazamundi, 450 for Lord Croak. Krokgar as well as Grimlock are worth 470 points for them, 700, 315 points for Tenhen Huen as well as your character mounts. As you can see here, we have our different character mounts that can actually take. Um, Connoisseurs, of course, are up there as well. So for our Slam Mage Priest, as you can see, they can take uh, Disciples up to the level ones up to 100 points, as well as Magic items up to 100 points. They can also act as your Battle Standard Bearer and still be your General as well. So that part's kind of cool. So if you want to save some points that way, you can do that. We have our Source Orb Old Bloods for 150 points, still pretty good with their stats as well as the weapons they can take like pull arms. they can still be mounted, can take light armor and shields, can now be mounted the new Horn 1 character or creature, so that's kind of cool as well, as well as our Carnosaur. They also got 100 points for magic items as well as 10 points from their blessed spawning, so we have those rules still attached to them. And of course we have Chak Axe for 210, Gorok for 230. Nakai, that character, he's actually now in 295 points for him, so we actually have that character. Also, we have Teta Iko, he's worth 190 points for that character. Uh, Tic Tac Toe is 135. Uh, Ozotl is actually worth 90 points, and then we have Inzi Huinzi, that's the character could actually rather hoard one. He's back with 75 points for him as well, so that character is kind of cool too. And then, of course, we have our Sora Scar Veterans. So, like, Sora Scar Veterans have been nerfed a little bit, and that's the reason why is because they can no longer ride Carnosaurs, as you can see here. They can only ride cold ones or hard ones. They can't ride Carnosaurs like they could before, so that's how they've been nerfed a little bit. I can kind of understand the rationale behind why they did that, but I disagree with it, but that's just me. 
Then of course we have our Skink Chiefs for 35 points. So like I said before, um, for their point values you can see here, they can only take uh, Troglodons now, can only be taken as a mount for the most part. So that's the reason why that's kind of a sad situation there. They're the only guys that can take that. And of course you have your Skink Priests, like we said before, they can take Troglodons as well. Or now they can ride the Quaddle, which is the new monster that we talked about earlier, for 220 points. So actually that's kind of cool there. And then of course we have our core units, Source Warriors are worth 11. And they can also take one Blessed Spawning for the entire unit now, so that's actually kind of cool for one point per model. Very cool. We have our Skink Cohorts, of course, with our Croxagore. Um, they can take Javelins, uh, Short Bows, they can also take, uh, with Poison Attacks, which is kind of cool. They can also take Croxagore now for every 8 Skinks for 43 points. And of course, they can take a Blessed Spawning for the entire unit, 1 point for your Skinks and 3 points for your Croxagore. So that part is pretty cool too, that you can do that Blessed Spawning for your units now. And of course we have Skink Skirmishers now, and of course they may take Blessed Spawnings as well uh, for one point, and they can take Short Bows again. So it's no longer just Javelins anymore, they can actually take Short Bows now. Um, which is kind of cool because back in the day for 4th edition, that's what they actually were equipped with, they're primarily Short Bows. They can take those as one of their main shooting elements for those. And of course we have our Jungle Swarms now, those are actually worth 35 points apiece now. For our special units, we have our Temple Guard, uh, 17 points. Uh, they can take a Magic Standard up with a 50. They could also have their Blessed Spawning for one point per model. Then we have our Coal One Riders, of course, our Saurus Cow for 24 points apiece. Uh, they could also take Blessed Spawnings too, which is makes them really cool. Croxagor can also take Blessed, blessed Spawning as well for three points apiece. And then we have our Chameleon Skinks for uh, 10 points, and they too can also take Blessed Spawning as well, which is actually pretty cool. Now moving on to our special units, we have our brand new unit, the Horned One Riders. They're worth 19 points apiece. They can take Javelins, uh, Magic Standard with 25 points. And once again, may take their one Blessed Spawning for two points per model. And then we have uh, Pterodon Riders for 33 points. They can also take Blessed Spawnings as well. And same thing with Ripper Dactyls. They can take 37 points and they can also take Blessed Spawnings as well. Now moving on to your rare choices. So like I said before, they kind of nerfed rare a little bit on this one. You can only take one of each type, unless of course you do a 3,000 points plus, then you can take duplicates. So we have our Salamander Hunting Packs for 80, Razernon Hunting Packs for 60. We also have our Bastilladons, so those guys are back now at 210 points. So once again, relocated to Rare Choice. I believe they used to be a Special Choice originally, but now they've been put to uh, Rare because balance, I guess. Then we have our Stegodons for 210, 15 points, so once again, Rodden for balance, as always. We can also upgrade to an H to stick it down for five. So balance, oh my god, balance. And then of course we have our Dread Saurian, which is actually kind of cool. Now, originally the Dread Saurian in the, um, what's it called, in the uh, Forge Rule miniature, you could actually take as many of these upgrades as you wanted to. You could actually take all of them if you wanted to uh, for your Dread Saurian. In this case, though, they kind of nerfed them a little bit just because it lets you only take one, which is kind of sad. So there's that. So balance, once again, rears its ugly head. And then, of course, we have our Kowatl, which is worth 220 points for that monster as well. And that, people, makes up our army lists for this one. All right, folks, there you have it. This is our review of the 9th edition rules for Warhammer Fantasy Lizardman Army book. In the end, this is another excellent resource that has been created by Matthias Eliasson. A lot of interesting rules, as well as a few new units, as well as some new rules attached to these guys that make them very, very interesting as well. And of course, if you plan on using 9th edition rules for your games of Warhammer Fantasy, this would be an excellent resource for you to use it for those of you guys who play Lizardman Armies. Um, and the best part about this product, of course, is that it's absolutely available to free to download from the Warhammer Armies project. So if you get a chance, stop by and check a look at that, uh, that uh, website, as well as the different materials he's created, because he's done an excellent job on all the materials that are on his website. So that's going to do it for this review, you guys. As always, please feel free to like, comment, and or subscribe. Your guys' input is invaluable to us, as always. Also check us out on Facebook, Instagram, as well as blogger.com for all the latest and greatest hobby news related to our channel. We will catch you guys in the next one. Peace out and stay classy.